the voice of Sherry. Hi, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And you are listening to Durian ASEAN. And today we have uh, a very um, wide array of news for you to uh, listen to. And we hope that uh, you have a great morning. Maybe you are in the car, you are at home, or you are simply, you know, just in bed lazing around. Yeah, and how have you been, Arlene? How, how, how was your night? Oh, it was a really fine night yesterday, even though it was a Wednesday night. But uh, I would say that I I realized that Malaysia, uh, I mean Kuala Lumpur itself, has a lot of great cuisine to uh, offer Malaysians and non-Malaysians alike. And I really enjoy last night, you know, having to favor, I mean, to to um, taste all the different dishes. And what about you, Gary? How was your night? Uh, my night was uh, amazing. I had some pretty uh, good food too. And uh, also, I guess um, today is a new day and, and I'm excited. And there's something very special happening on Friday, which I will not reveal. But yeah, I guess I'm just uh, excited for that. Yeah, me too. I'm excited for you for being excited. <laughs> but uh, I guess um, at the end of the day, um, I feel that... Um, being in Duran Asia and reporting news for our listeners is definitely one of the things that I look forward every morning. And we have a fresh set of news to share and discuss with our uh, beloved and loyal listeners. So for the first news, it's about sports. So, Gauri, how to make Malaysia excel in sports? Okay, there are a lot of ways here according to the star, as, as reported by the star. And I guess the main um, problem, or I wouldn't say problem, maybe the main concern here is the fact that we lost to Singapore, which is always uh, a which sensitive thing. Was that? When uh, I mean in Commonwealth, we mm. actually finished um, just behind Singapore. We we were one place behind, and uh, a lot of people are obviously upset about that because. Uh, this Malaysia Singapore rivalry thing, you know, um, it's it's kind of a sensitive thing. We always try to be ahead of them, and I guess we were really really close, but we didn't manage to um, beat them. Well, to be fair, ours was home uh, homegrown talent, while Singapore has naturalized Chinese nationals, and the Island Republic had focus on fewer spots than Malaysia. I guess that's uh, one of the reasons why as well, because we try to. Um, focus on a wider uh, range of sports. I mean, we, we did do uh, pretty well with people like Nicole David, uh, Lee Chong Wei, and um, I guess they really uh, made us proud. And don't forget Malaysians. our swimming competition, our the swimming category. Yeah, that's uh, right. One of our, um, I mean, two of our swimmers, actually won, each one of them won each, uh, one goal and one bronze, if I'm not mistaken. So it seems that this year we have six golds, seven silver and six bronze uh, medals uh, by a team with 180 competitors and 72 officials, which is a far cry from the 2010 uh, Commonwealth Games and is in fact our worst performance in the past five games held for countries that were once um, part of the British Empire. Yeah, and after all, we once beat football teams like South Korea and other regional teams before they caught up and went past Malaysia and now compete in the World Cup regularly. Uh, yeah, that, that that is another concern uh, with Malaysians as well, that we are, apart from the World Cup, it's, it seems to be really hard for us to... Um, to to compete and also to to really um, excel uh, at international level. I guess in mm. Asia, uh, probably still not so bad. But when it comes to um, a worldwide thing, we are still lagging. We are still uh, pretty much um, left behind. Well, interestingly, uh, two days ago, I actually bought a book. It's not really a book. It's more like a booklet sort of book. It's called Why Malaysia Never Entered the World Cup. Oh, yeah, it was it was pretty interesting because he sort of gave like the brutal facts about why Malaysia is not fit to uh to join the World Cup and 
it's not just about the player it's about the whole structure itself uh, and it's also, it's also not about not not just so much about the funding because i think malaysia malaysian government gave quite an, um a good focus on the football it's just that the whole structure itself needs to be rehaul so that you know at the end of the day mm. i think professionalism should come first over other things i would i would um take a more um personal approach on this in the sense that um when it comes to uh sports it's not just about um i mean you probably go for a more um holistic uh approach but i also f- uh, feel like it it comes down to um the way you you prepare yourself it also goes down to your mentality Uh, I was reading a book about the Russians, how um, they prepare for all these major sports events. And oh, they, they are do, very good with gymnastics yeah, and, and all and other... It seems that they focus a lot on mental training compared to physical training. What do you mean by uh, mental they training? They actually visualize themselves running, mm. swimming, or gymnastics, whatever sports it is, before they actually go for the physical training. And, and, and I think <coughs> also because diet is also important, And with Malaysia, I don't think any sportsman or sportswoman who are serious about getting the goal in any other international competition should <laughs> consume Malaysian food. That, that's, you I know, was just going to say that. <laughs> that's the reality. <laughs> Malaysian food is probably not so good for the athletes. And uh, I think it's also uh, reasonably uh, difficult to avoid nasi goreng and all that. Nasi lemak <laughs> is in point. <laughs> But I, I yeah, I, I guess it goes down to um a lot of factors and um one of it is is probably the training, the funding and it also goes back to to how hard they really want this and <clears throat> I guess But you know, um but at the end of the day mm. Singapore has a fairer advantage because they naturalize Chinese nationals. I mean, if Malaysia is to follow suit that path, uh, we could have like nationalized. I mean, we could like naturalize maybe Suarez or whoever that we think that we can yeah, buy Suarez over. Yeah, Suarez will just bite people, so let's not <laughs> go there. No, I mean, um, the the fact is, I think it's very important that uh, we look at a bigger picture. Of course, we want to be better than Singapore, but we also under- have to understand that they have a fair advantage and we don't. But I, 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 I will actually disagree on that. I feel like instead of uh, using that as an excuse, we can work on other advantages that we have and also use that to uh, beat uh, Singapore. If they have um, naturalized Chinese nationals, we have an Real added Chinese advantage. <laughs> and, you know, we have Chinese, we have Malays, we have um, Indians, and we have um, other races as well. And we can use that to our advantage. Like, uh, for example, Pandalela, she um, is, is from the Borneo area and she did uh, really well uh, as well. So I think and, that... Uh, I mean, kudos to the swimming team, Mala- su- uh, Malaysian swimming team. Without them, I think none of Malaysians ever even put an eye to the swimming competition. Usually we would look at Chinese or Russian or whoever that is non-Malaysian, you know. Uh, we would look forward to them. But now we have Malaysians actively competing and winning medals. And to me, it's a good sign that to show Malaysians are up there just one step at a time. I think, yeah, I think we will um, get there. We just need to uh, buck up and be more serious about actually uh, getting involved more in international sports and, and taking it more seriously. Mm-hmm. And th- there is sports. Uh, definitely, we need to take it more seriously. But... Another, on the other topic, which I'll mention it in a bit, I don't think we should take it seriously at all. So, the story is like this. Uh, the social media were hype about this. It's about nudity. A group of Singaporean uh, men and women, they were nude at, I think it was an island, a secluded, a secluded island, and Penang Knights were not happy about it. Yeah, and uh, Lim Guan Eng is also another person who is really um, shocked by uh, this incident. And he said that there will be no nude beaches in Penang following that uh, video k- clip that uh, went viral on Facebook yesterday. I think Mal- Malaysians in general have problem with nudity. That Yeah, that, that, that is one thing uh, that I guess we... Or oh, Malaysians from Peninsula, I would say. Because we do have a, a generally a very conservative um, community and um, even being an Islam Islamic um, country uh, as well, it 
Um, but I think it goes it goes beyond just religion. I think in general, Malaysian, regardless of race or religion, they mm-hmm. are very conservative in the way they they see how we should lead our life. And uh, I think uh, Lim Kuan Eng also said that the state would not allow any nudist uh, activities to thrive. And um, he also called on the relevant authorities and said that he will leave the uh, leave it to the police to um, investigate this this matter and to um, carry on with it. Lim Kuan Eng also mentioned that if Penang does not allow casinos to be opened, it will certainly not allow any nudist activities. He said that he doesn't know that such an event was held and no way he was he will allow it anymore. Uh, I think a lot of people were shocked when this video came out because, I mean, I'm obviously from Penang and uh, you yesterday were on Facebook, yeah, a lot of my friends were from Penang were shocked too. They were like, wait, wait, this is in Penang? Like, where and when did this happen? Like, how, how is this even possible? Uh, I even saw a friend of mine posted a uh, uh, a status in his Facebook. He said that I eat on the seashores um, of Penang all the time. I think, uh, but I I never seen any of this activity before. Where is it? Why is miss out on this? Well, yeah. So um, I I I guess um, they will be uh, investigated accordingly and um, be left to the to the police to uh, make the decisions. But you know, on the other hand, this is my own personal opinion. I I would definitely would not take it too seriously when it comes to this group of nudies. I mean, as long as they don't harm people, they don't they do it in private, meaning that it's just them and no one else. I guess it was in private, but now. Um, I guess the whole world has access to that video, so it's not really that private anymore. Um, yeah, uh, apparently so. I mean, uh, my f- a friend of mine, like I said to you, mm. he 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 always have his dinner at the Lok Bahang, but he said that I never seen any new this activity before. Why did I mm. miss out on this? Uh, I think at the end of the day, I have no problem with nudity, but it's also because of my own liberal views. Um. It is, um, but I understand like uh, other people, it would be a bit, a bit, uh, it will be more offending to them f- to see other people's private parts being exposed. And uh, I guess another news that is also um, getting quite uh, offensive in that sense is um, outraged Malaysians who are stepping on Israeli flags to protest um, these Gaza attacks. Lately, there's a trend for it. Seems it like. Uh, in social media, in public, even in weddings. <laughs> That's right. And actually, we will be discussing um, that in detail um, mm-hmm. in uh, our session later. But yeah, the, uh, I think it's it's getting out of hand. And um, it's it's great that people are voicing out their concern and that people, are, you know, they, they still have this um, humanity in them. And they, they don't they're not happy about the fact that people that, you know, thousands of people are being killed somewhere in the Middle East. But I guess the way that they are protesting is just, it just, some of it just doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will discuss about that more, but just to give uh, an overview, what happened uh, was Malaysian are beginning to show their rage against the Israeli j- regime by stepping on their flags for its attack on Gaza that have killed, uh, of course, thousands of people, uh, which is currently happening now. Uh, and uh, for example, Muhammad Hilmi Muslim and Nurfadila Muhammad Baral- Baraldin choose to do so on their wedding day to show their displeasure towards the killings of innocent lives, especially the Palestinian civilians. Uh, and they say that this is the least that they can do as Malaysia as Malaysians to show their rage against the outreach against the regime. And the flags are only good to be stepped on. Which, like, I think off air you told me mm-hmm. how they place it on as a mat, mm-hmm. and all the visitors uh, who come to their house uh, would, you know, naturally step on it. Mm-hmm. Oh well, that is definitely very uh, disrespectful. Even um, even though um, Israel is killing a lot of people, and of course I do not um, agree with what Israel is doing as well, but to go to um, that extent that you are just, I think eventually you're just probably humiliating yourself uh, Mm -hmm. in that sense. And uh, so far there have been um, 1,655 Palestinians killed, and they are mostly civilians. 
and uh, 65 uh, Israelis have died in the in the conflict. Yeah, and I just want to highlight what happened last Saturday was thousands of Malaysians gathered at Dataran Merdeka to show their support against the uh, uh, sorry their supports for Palestinians and condemn the violence in Gaza. And I think at the end of the day, I is something that the most Malaysian public can do. Uh, we we definitely obviously we can't change any policy, especially related to international relations between countries. We our voices our, our voices <clears throat> is not as big as probably other countries' voices. Our population is quite slow, uh, quite small. So at the end of the day, eh, I think protest is the way forward that Malaysians could do the most. And um, in addition to that news, uh, we have uh, a British Muslim minister who quits um, over the Gaza policy. <coughs> and this British <coughs> minister was actually the first Muslim to sit in the cabinet. And she resigned on Tuesday over um, the, the government's policy, um, uh, which is called the morally indefensible policy on, on Gaza. Mm, interesting. And that... <coughs> Sorry, that British Muslim minister, she was Baroness Saida Warsi, a minister at the Foreign Office and for Faith and Communities, heap fresh pressure on President eh, sorry, on Prime Minister David Cameron to take a tougher line against Israel over the at actions in Gaza. His coalition government has faced sustained criticism in recent days, led by the main opposition Labour Party that it has not spoken out strongly against uh, <clears throat> Israel and over the killings of 1,900... Oh, this is a different number now. Um, Palestine, uh, the killing of 1,900 Palestinian. So, <clears throat> in, in other words, they say that the British approach in Gaza is morally indefen- indefensible and it's not British national interest and will have a long-term detri- detrimental impact on their international reputations internationally and also domestically. Uh, it seems like this is also uh, a question of uh, of her being in a dilemma and also battling with her um, own conscience because um, as I guess as a Muslim itself, of course, she feels... Um, she can really relate to what's mm. what's happening in Palestine, and also, l- like I said, it goes back to to humanity. It's yeah. not really about what country you are, what <coughs> what race you are. When there are people uh, being killed in in such huge numbers, and they're mostly um, students, just um, little innocent kids, of course you don't just um, stay quiet about it. And um, I guess this is her way of of showing that she's not happy with with the And it's not just her personal conscience. We have to understand that she has her constituents to answer. And majority, I mean, we have to face the fact today's Britain is different from yesterday's Britain. They are a a huge population of immigrants or generations of second or third generations of immigrants. So we have to understand that majority of these immigrants are Muslims. And it's not just the interest of Muslims. Uh, I think it's in the interest of the British people as well. I think uh, the British people, they are, they have much more consciousness in them when it comes to the issue of Gaza, partly because compared to the last war, this war has more graphic and also visual um view about the whole issue relating to the killings and I mean you see it on social media on um, television and all that everyone is reporting about it every, every news channel no matter how much pro-Israel they are they still have to show that you know the killings are just unfair and unbalanced um, but then again like it also depends um, on, on the different media and I think like like what I I said uh, last week I think that like you you were mentioning about the immigrants in uh, British and one of the singer from uh, One Direction who is who also happens to be a Pakistani and his uh, family uh, migrated um, to um, Britain and there are a lot of people um, like that and it also goes back to the sensitivity of the people when you have um, a large amount of uh, Muslims in the country and yet you're you're keeping quiet about about this. Um, 
cruelty if I may that's happening um, somewhere else mm-hmm. and you're just taking this uh, in morally indefensible policy yeah um, I have no words to describe because I think that what she is doing is something that is um, very admirable and it's not because of the issue of Gaza I think it's for her to put a stop, you know, for yeah, she's for for Britain, yeah, for Brit- for Britain, not for Britain to be defending, you know, their policy throughout the years without having without ever, you know, changing it for the sake of humanity, and I think that's more important. And our next news is about Singapore again. Um, this is about the haze. So Singapore passes new law to combat haze. The Parliament has passed the uh, Transboundary Case Pollution Act on Tuesday, which targets companies and other entities that uh, either cause or condone uh, fires that lead to unhealthy levels of haze. So and pa- if you yeah. notice, the haze has been um, getting really bad again the, it the is. last couple of days. It's ups and downs uh, when it comes to the haze. <coughs> and I am still surprised that the government hasn't imposed on any curfew uh, you know, the schools are not being um, given off and whereas people are still out and about walking around. And Remember the haze happened during Hari Raya. People were so busy consuming food and being with their family. None of the government, missionary or, or anyone took notice about the haze. Well, I think uh, I can't help but to think about uh, Yasmin from uh, Eco Nights when she was here talking about the haze and she had a, a similar uh, opinion as well when she said that she is surprised that people are just going about with their daily lives as if the haze has always been there. And it's kind of like part of our life now mm-hmm. that it's like the elephant <coughs> in the room that we just don't even bother addressing anymore. And it's really going to have a detrimental effect on us in the long run. We, we can ignore it now. We can just say, oh, it's haze, it's fine, I can still go to work. You know the biggest problem with Malaysians when it comes to like issues that are not pressing enough, like the Gaza issue, is the concept of, uh, the idea of apathy. They just do not care on any issues that they think that they can't help at all. So at the end of the day, they will just, you know, carry on their lives. And I think it's not good because at the end of the day, nobody is held responsible of their action. But, I mean, it's true, there is nothing that we can do about the haze because it's it's there and it's not something that uh, we humans can control. And I, I guess the government uh, do have a specific uh, method. I, don't, they... I, don't, I, I do not disagree that we can't control over the amount of haze that is being spewed because we have to understand that haze is a problem that is transboundary, uh, among all nation, nations, if Singapore can pass a new law to combat haste, what about Malaysia? Is it even being discussed in the parliament? It's left to be said. And also, uh, I guess people can also uh, take some precautions by ourselves, you know, uh, while waiting for the government to, to come up with something, uh, probably, I don't know, wear a mask or try to stay uh, indoor more often. Don't, don't try to... Um, do any outdoor activities uh, I guess the PSA will be coming from us (laughs) not the government (laughs) that Uh, that works too so I just want to highlight what uh, was the law that Singapore has just passed the penalties in the new law to combat haze could rise if future reviews find them insufficient it was spoken by the uh, Environment and Water Resources Minister and penalties And the practicality of enforcing a Singapore law on firms overseas, among other things, were indebted in the parliament before the act was passed. And it garnered a unanimous support from members of the parliament across party lines. But in all, um, nine MPs, um, non-constituency MPs and nominated members of parliament spoke on the bill over two days. And they broadly agreed that penalties, which are up to 100,000 Singapore dollars per day of unhealthy haze and go up to 2 million. And they actually thought that that were too low compared to the size of firms' profits and the harm caused by the haze. I, I really like the way that they're thinking that um, 2 million is too low for the amount of damage that these uh, multinational uh, companies are, are causing on, uh, on the environment. And I think that I really think that everyone should start thinking this way because 
the environment and us, we are so closely connected, you know, a simple change in the environment can impact our health in, in a tremendous manner. It's funny because we always think that, oh, Singapore is this authoritarian authoritarian state that will just do whatever they want based on what they think that is right. But at the end of the day, we also have to realize that whether what, what, what kind of whether your your system is democratic or authoritarian or communist or whatever, are you doing the right thing, you know, to safeguard the country's interests and also to stay to safeguard the environmental interests looking at the bigger picture and I think Singapore is definitely moving forward forward to that. And I hope Indonesia and Malaysia would follow suit because I think the haze now is coming from companies from Malaysia, MNC from Malaysia, multinational companies, and also from lands in Sumatra, which is majority, uh, I mean, which is in Indonesia, of, obviously. And the last news of today, we just want to highlight that Philippines China Sea Action uh, Plan in getting support. So the Philippines said it had won support from Vietnam, Indonesia, and Brunei for a plan to ease tensions in the South China. See which uh, it intends to present at a regional meeting this week. And yeah, China and several of its Southeast Asian neighbors are embroiled in the increasingly bitter territorial disputes. Obviously, is the South China Sea disputes, um, which Beijing claims is almost entirely theirs. Mm-hmm. Well, Manila plan plans, sorry, Manila's plan call for an immediate mem- moratorium on activities which escalate tensions and implement a code of conduct in the sea, which I think uh, the U.S. will be participating in monitoring that, uh, which is home to vital ship routes and is believed to sit um, atop vast oil and gas deposit. I think that would be probably the main reason why China and some of the ASEAN countries want to claim the South China Sea. And this plan will be presented on uh, to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations meeting in Myanmar this week. And uh, was raised during the Foreign Secretary uh, Albert Del Rosario's recent visit to Brunei, Vietnam uh, and Indonesia, the department spokesman Charles Jose said. And um, just uh, to give some credits, uh, today's news was from um, the Star and the Malaysian Insider. Yeah, and just to wrap it to wrap this up, just to let you know, if you are interested to follow us, our news, our podcast and all that, you can always go to our Facebook. We have all the latest updates uh, for tomorrow's speakers as well, as well as for today. And we obviously, you can follow us on Twitter. We are quite active there. And Gauri, they can always listen to our recordings yeah, that's right. YouTube, they can right? subscribe to our YouTube channel at uh, YouTube uh, slash Durian ASEAN. And um, they can uh, listen to all our podcasts. And we also upload uh, a three-minute video from all our guests. And if they don't have their computer with them, they can always listen to us on the TuneIn app on their smartphones. Just download the app and look for Durian ASEAN. It's as simple as that.